Um, hello, everybody, and welcome. Um, greetings. I'm Dr. Jenny Neville from Royal Holloway University of London, and on behalf of myself and my colleague, Dr. Megan Cavell from the University of Birmingham, I'd like, like to welcome you all to today's seminar. And this event comes as out of our AHRC project, which is entitled Group Identity and the Early Medieval Riddle Tradition. You can find out more about this project on the website, The Riddle Ages. Um, and for example, you'll find their recordings from our last year's seminar series, which was entitled Early Medieval Identities. And um, also coming up soon, we hope, um, watch, out, watch this space for Riddle Quest, an escape room located at Sutton Hoo. But for today, we're continuing with our Riddles in Conversation series. The Exeter Book Riddles, as some of you know, um, were left frustratingly, or I prefer to think delightfully, unsolved in their 10th century manuscript. And they're often used to um, illustrate what we think we know about early medieval culture, but the truth is they're actually much better at asking questions than giving answers. So in this seminar series, we're putting the Exeter book riddles in conversation with different kinds of knowing. And our conversation today is about how one riddle, commonly, but not always, called Riddle 57, um, how this riddle brought together academics, poets, and printmakers during the pandemic lockdown. And I'm delighted to be interviewing today three members of that community. So now I have to share my slides, which are, which are gone. <laughs> oh God. There, can we see, can you all see my slides now? Yeah, yes. sorry about that. I was supposed to have them better ready. So today I'll be talking to Emma Maloney, a printmaker and producer who enjoys creating public engagement projects that take printmaking out of its traditional studio domain. Um, we also have Jacob Pauly, Professor of Creative Writing at Newcastle University, who won the 2016 T.S. Eliot Prize for Poetry for his fourth book of poems uh, entitled Jack Self. We have our very own Megan Cavell, who works on Old English and Anglo-Latin poetry with a special interest in animals, gender, and riddling verse. And she's the principal investigator for this uh, AHRC project, but today she's going to be participating um, with a different kind of hat. Um, and unfortunately, we don't have Chris Jones today. He's professor of medieval and modern poetry at the University of St. Andrews, uh, as well as a poet and a musician himself. Although he can't be with us, he's produced a video, which we'll watch if we have time today, um, or if not, we will include it in the recording of the session so that you can look at it later. And the plan for today is we're going to be talking about the project for about 30 minutes or so. Then we'll play through the, the product of the project, uh, a, a video, um, and play with it a bit, hopefully, if we can make it work. And then we'll have about 15 minutes at the end for your comments and questions. So uh, to start off with then, Emma, if I could come to you, could you um, start us off with a quick introduction to the project and to Double Elephant. Sure, thank you, Jenny. Um, well, Double Elephant Print Workshop is a uh, um, unusually named. It's, it's the the name comes from the largest size of paper. It's a printmaking studio based in Exeter. So by printmaking, I mean we do etching, screen print, lino. So it's fine art printmaking, and as well as being an artist led studio, we do courses, workshops. Um, and we do, we're particularly interested in multidisciplinary projects. Um, we do a lot of outreach work. We've got little portable etching presses, which we take out to museums, festivals, schools, galleries, prisons. Um, so we're always interested in seeing where printmaking can end up. And so that's Double Elephant. And then in 2020, this project was something that we worked on together, this group. Um, it started before the lockdown, but it quickly became a really positive project to focus on in this isolation, is, this period of isolation. Okay, so um, that's great. Um, it sounds fascinating. I especially like this idea about um, printmaking leaving the studio and going into different different places, different public places. But could you maybe tell us what drew you specifically to the Exeter book and to the riddles? What, what about them spoke to you as a printmaker? 
Um, well, to be honest, they didn't really make a lot of sense and still, until I started talking to Chris, Jake and Megan. Um, but what, why this started is because in Exeter, we, Exeter in 2019 had just been made uh, UNESCO City of Literature. And I didn't really even know about this book of riddles, but the Exeter book um, was one of the, the key reasons Exeter got that status. So, um, and, and Double Elephant have had a history of working with interesting archival material. So there are, there are amazing kind of uh, collaborative projects like we'd worked with the Leonard Baskin Ted Hughes archive in the university and printmaking and poetry can come together and have some incredible results. So we were really interested in exploring this book of riddles, but we wanted to do more than just illustrate. So we wanted to work with contemporary poets, work with translators, work with people who really knew these and help us create an opportunity for visual artists, for printmakers. It wasn't limited to printmakers, but for people to come together um, and do something with it. And there, I'm just gonna explain that because everyone's looking at slide wondering why the Duchess of Cornwall's there with me looking at the riddle last year. So this was when the City of Literature uh, two years later got the chance to kind of showcase various um, creative projects that had come out of this UNESCO status and Prince Charles and the Duchess of Cornwall came and um, looked at these project, projects and explored the riddle. And I'll talk more about the prints that, that are on the screen a bit later because those are some of the children's responses from various workshops. Okay. Okay, so once you started talking to these people then was there anything in particular about the Exeter book, and once you started to get to know it, um, and about the text that that drew you to them and made you think this was a, a good focus for your work? Oh yes, yeah. so, I mean so much, the ambiguity of them, the fact that there are no right answers, um, and then like Jake described it, there, you know, there, there were windows into ordinary lives of people a thousand years ago, and we were really keen to kind of it's, think about contemporary encounters with these. So what are the parallels? What would still resonate? Um, and in fact, there were elements of this project that began that, did, that had to stop because it wasn't actually a, a project we could do in person. As you'll hear, this became a lockdown project done entirely online. But as printmakers, we were interested in the materials. This book, you know, it's what about parchment and vellum and ink and oak gall ink? These are pigments and, and things that really um, are interesting for us as printmakers. So that's something that later I could introduce into workshops, but initially um, that was part of a much longer project that we were going to do, um, pairing, pairing the riddles with contemporary trades, thinking about the riddles as knowledge. Um, and basically the project began as kind of a, an idea to give Exeter its own voice in responding to the riddles. The, the, this book has been analysed internationally, but actually there isn't an Anglo-Saxon department at Exeter University. and. Mo most people I'd say in Exeter didn't really even know it existed so mm. it was about bringing it into the public domain and creating something new from it. Okay. Um, I've got another question about how the, the pandemic had an impact on the project but I think I might leave that to the end because I think we'll come come back to that towards the end and maybe can I move on now um, to Megan. Um, Megan can you read the riddle that the, um, the group chose to us now? I was going to say, no, of course not, but sure I can. I'm Thank conscious you. that we didn't include the whole riddle on the slide, so I'm going to put it in the chat okay. so everybody can read along with me if you'd like. Um, that's silent. Um, and apologies for any um, muck-up pronunciations. We'll blame it on my current bout of COVID. Feos luft burris litle wichte over beo chleoda thasind blaka suiza swerta salopada Sangas ropa herpam feras, chluda chirmas, tredas beronasas, huilumburg salo nita berna, nemnes husilfa. Thank you. That's always it, so great to hear short. the actual language. <laughs> yeah. Um, there's almost a hundred riddles in this manuscript, Megan. Can you tell us why you settled on this one in particular? So as a group, we didn't know initially, we definitely wanted to do riddles, but we kind of moved in that direction. Uh, I won't take full credit for that, but everybody here knows how obsessed I am with them. Um, but we wanted a short text, first of all. Uh, we didn't want anything too grim because we were, you know, the start of lockdown, things were depressing enough as it was. 
Um, and we were all talking about how much sort of local nature had become important to us at that point. You know, we were all stuck in our houses. Those of us lucky enough to have access to green spaces were getting to know the local birds, um, the local insects, squirrels, et cetera, rather well. Um, let alone people who had you know, sheep or deer taking over their village high streets at the time. So we knew we wanted something not too grim, something related to nature. And we also wanted something that was going to inspire a real range of responses from the artistic communities that we were engaging with. Um, as Emma already said, we wanted something with no consensus, or that's what we were really drawn to, something that had a riddle that didn't have a set solution that wasn't too kind of um, puzzly, you know, the ones that you can work through, they've got a cipher or a code. We didn't want that. We didn't want a right answer because we wanted everybody to approach it on their own merits. Mm. Uh, so we settled on Riddle 57 um, and then Chris, Jake and I each picked a solution in advance before translating it. Um, I, we, I won't tell you what our translations were so that we can enjoy playing with it later. Chris actually changed his mind partway through, changed his, trans, um, his solution while he was in the process of translating. And then each of us played with sort of different sound effects, with alliteration, with compounds, with metaphors in different ways as we went through our translation. Um, and each of us smuggled in something not there in the old English text, a giveaway prompt um, to kind of nudge people towards our translation. Um, so that's how we approached it, and I think it turned out pretty well. Great, thank you. And I turn to you now, Jake. Um, I understand that you wrote a kind of interim poem to prompt visual contributions from the printmaking community. Could you maybe read that poem to us now? Yeah, for sure, yes. And um, I, I'll maybe kind of say a little bit about this, because, you know, it's it's maybe not clear from what we've said so far, but um, you know what, what we what we set out to do was kind of invite um, c contributions from um, in, you know image makers. We 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 invited image contributions, you know, uh, visual representations of this image, um, and you know I, the the riddles are, uh, I think are kind of generative. You know, they they, they ask us for solutions. They, they intrigue, they provoke, they, they seek from us responses and lookings again at the, the, the objects and the animals and the phenomena of the world. Um, and, and this project kind of seemed to capture for me something of that, that generative creative energy. And when we were talking about how to elicit responses in, in visual form to, to the riddle, I, I kind of couldn't get my head around how we were gonna do this. You know, how, how are we going to use an old English riddle to, to provoke people to create images that, that might or might not bear a relationship to the possible solutions to this riddle. You know, I didn't know how we were going to do this. So I kind of sat down and wrote what I'm what I'm about to read you, th thinking about this question. And I, I wrote this quite quite quickly, quite intuitively, not, not necessarily believing we were going to use it. Um, you know, I didn't, I didn't set out to, you know, I wasn't tasked to do it or anything like that. But I think I was asking the, the, the potential image makers to, to picture me something as, as the riddles ask us to, to, to say what, you know, to say what I am. Um, and I was also thinking about the text of, of Riddle 57 and about translation. So the poem is a, is a kind of refraction and unpacking of the riddle. Um, as well as a, 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 a feeling out of translation itself, I think, and of the textures and, and implications and, and pure, pure pleasure of, of synonyms, particularly, I think. Um, and I'm, I'm, you know, I'm intrigued by translation and, and translation for me is related to, to metaphor, which I'm, I'm sure people have said this kind of thing before, but it makes the experience of having these highly uh, metaphorical, um, linguistically slippery and enigmatic riddles in Old English, then looking to carry them over into modern English or into artwork and images, are conceptually very rich. So, you know, the, the, the matter of the riddles for me is bound up with the, I have to say, the limited and assisted access I have to their original language as well as bound up with the questions the riddles themselves pose about language and who or what 
um, possesses or understands language and how um, we can give you know the non-human a voice so that's there's a little bit of background here just just to that just to this point which is you, you'll realize is, a, is a, a a large unpacking you know it's it's a bigger it's a three minute poem which doesn't sound very long but in in the world of poetry that's quite a long kind of poem and it's much longer than the the, the original but i'll read it for you Thank and you. it's just called I've, I've just titled it little somethings Picture me air, open space, a breeze, emptiness, loftiness, a nothingness on which things are carried. Picture me little somethings carried, lifted, borne aloft, transmitted, wheeled, wafted, floated. Picture me a hillside, a slope, a crag, a hill, a boulder stone, a steepness, a rise, an incline, an angle, a tilt. Picture me dark little somethings carried, lifted, borne aloft, transmitted, wheeled, wafted, floated over. Picture me the blackest little somethings. Picture me a cloak of shadow, a sallow shawl. Picture me nightwear. Picture me a heap, a mass, a crowd, a drove, a troop, a squabble. Picture me a heap's noise, the holler of a mass, the cry of a crowd, a drove's call, a squabble. Picture me a crowding together to sound. Picture me a traveling, a faring forth, a journey of the blackest little somethings, carried, lifted, borne aloft in heaps, in a mass, in a crowding together, in a squabble, making a loud noise, calling out, crying, sounding. Picture me a fullness of song, a song unstinting, a noisy drawl, a racket song, a carried sound. Picture me little somethings full of it, not stopping, drawling, racketing, carrying, and all they carry, sound. Picture me a woody headland, a promontory, a timbered stand, an arboreal cape, a forested outcrop, a bluff of wood, a grove, a glen, a peninsula wooded, overgrown, green. Picture me a tread, a visit, a flyby, a perch, a buzz, a settling, a print, a mark, an impression, a track, a stamp, a landing, a pacing, a taking off. Picture me little black somethings that might. Picture me a built hall, a walled place, a town home, a city villa, a roofscape, a place unnatural, a human habitation, a thought out house, a dwelling designed, a site where people are. Picture me sometimes. Picture me little somethings that name what they are, whose song is their name, whose noise is themselves, who sound their own name, whose music is them, who know or don't know their own name, but make known their own name with themselves. Thank you. Mm, that is a wonderful un unpacking of a really, sh um, really rich but short poem. Um, can I turn now to, to Emma? Um, when faced with that poem, that unpacking, can you tell us a little bit about the response from your printmaking community? Yes, I'll try. I mean, what we did was then share Jake's poem. Actually, I feel like we kind of chopped it up a bit, but we, we shared it as prompts. We thought of this as prompts and put it out in as many formats as possible. Um, so it was our printmaking community. It was international printmaking communities. This project actually brought us quite close to other print studios who'd closed. Um, and we put it out there as an opportunity for everyone, for schools, schools who are still open in lockdown, um, for homeschooling and the, and the students that were coming into schools, for community groups. We work with, we have a print on prescription scheme, which is for adults living with mental health issues. And so we could open this out to them. So it was just shared really widely as much as possible that, you know, people could just email back whatever they had. If they were making work at home, any response, if it was, whether it was print or not, um, and we tried to keep the brief really simple without encouraging people to kind of make up their minds what they thought it was. It was just responding to Jake's prompts, basically, 
to elicit imagery. And from that, we got about 200 um, emailed digital copies of work, some of it created specifically. And you'll see that in the clips of the slides of some of the submissions. And yeah, then they were created into the riddle by Luke and Corinne Hagen, who are amazing filmmakers and programmers. And that was the bit that was out of all of our hands. That was like over to them to, to make this interactive mid riddle um, and was something that kind of came back and was amazing because that's where a lot of the magic happened. They, they spliced things together and, and created it again. So it's like another process of, of creation really. I don't know if that answers Jenny. That's kind of a vague yeah, no, answer. No, that's 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 great. So there was a, a, a there was the original Old English text, and then 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 Jake unpacked it and unfolded it, and then it got dispersed even farther out into the community, and then then you submitted it to your your visual um, your your video artist, who then brought it back into 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 one place. Is that have I got that about yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, and. Yeah. And then and through that, we were also have meeting up online on, and discussing that. So we decided together as a group, the format of the riddle, like how we were gonna break this down into pages. Where were people going to choose? Um, where could the riddle then unfold? Because there are so many choices that this riddle could mm -hmm. be. And what would it, what would the final result be? Would people have created their own poem? Um, mm -hmm. So it was, it was kind of, we were, look, we were interested in the visual response, but also how, the riddle was unfolding for people with mm -hmm. with the translations okay i'm going to stop sharing now and try and get um the group of you all together on the screen if that if that will work um and then just ask you um that question about about lockdown are we all here now yes um just that question about um what did this project mean to you um when you were trying to collaborate remotely uh, in those difficult circumstances of lockdown. I don't know who wants to go first. Maybe I'm... Megan go first or or oh, not. Fine. Um, I, <laughs> I can't escape the irony that when we were doing this project, I had long COVID but didn't know that's what it is. And now that we're recording this session, I have COVID and it's fine and I know what it is and I've been able to test for it. It seems like some sort of weird envelope pattern. It's good, it's an old English poetic device. Um, I don't know, at the time, everybody was terrified. There was anxiety everywhere. And it was really nice to have a bite-sized project to focus all of that kind of frenetic energy on, to have a new group of colleagues to work with and sort of have semi-regular. I mean, we didn't even know how Zoom worked then. We were learning about <laughs> Zoom with each other and, and about our own Wi-Fi compatibilities, um, meeting up semi-regularly and just sort of having the chance to talk to a small group, even though we were all living in our houses and unable to go out again. So that was really nice. Um, that's, yeah, I guess it was, it was nice to make new friends despite thinking the world was ending. And to use Old English, my favorite, Old English riddles, my favorite subject to bring everyone together. It's not a very scholarly answer, but I'm gonna leave it there. What about you, Jake? What did it mean for you to be doing this project remotely during lockdown? Yeah, I, I'm just I'm just thinking back to kind of how and you know how how memory is is kind of made of it's it's not really made of specifics so much, it's made of a kind of um texture and 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 feeling. And I I, I just had this kind of feeling when we were doing it of of kind of a, a openness and and um despite the fact that everything was kind of locked down and closed down and, and it was all about restriction for me kind of doing the project um kind of a, kind of opened something up and I, I think that the, the idea that we were we were soliciting responses from so many people and those responses actually came was kind of really extraordinary for me I was very very kind of surprised by this and um kind of elated actually so you know beside all everything that Megan says which is true as well that you know it was wonderful to kind of meet people and, and um, have a kind of collaborative project and, and, and feel part of a, of, a, of a small community and then a wider community of kind of printmakers was really it was really um, a, a kind of tonic for, for me um, and 
yeah, I was, you know, I was just very surprised that we solicited the responses that we did. And I was amazed by the, the, the variety and the kind of excitement of those as well. I'm just thinking back to, to kind of what's on some of those, those images, you know, and it's things like surfers and, um, you know, dandelion seeds and, you know, just very unexpected things, you know, which, which I, I just found really, um, you know, brilliantly, uh, brilliant translations, again, of, you know, kind of what, what, what the, the artistic community and the printmaking community have been presented with, you know. And what about you, Emma? What was it like for yeah, you? What did it feel like for you? Initially, it just felt like such a shock because this was an 18 month project we'd started in February. Suddenly the National Lottery Heritage Fund had pulled the money, the University of Exeter had pulled what they'd contributed because for everybody, things were in an emergency and we're all freelance at Double Elephant, so we needed to keep working. So with a very small amount of Arts Council um, COVID funding, we redid this project for £7,000 and that's partly due, due to the generosity of everybody working for a very small fee. But I think what felt exciting was, yes, this, this way of linking up and doing something creative and everything that was, all our interactions with the public from people we'd never met before were really positive. So people were sending in their, their prints or their photographs of their drawings or things that their children had done at home saying, we'd love doing this. We've really loved having some text to work with. Um, this really spoke to me or like, I really enjoyed thinking about nature. And um, yeah, I think that people really liked having a brief and a boundary and, a, and, a, and a, something to, to focus on that was open, but um, it wasn't just kind of make anything. And it was quite freeing the way that it was all going to be a big collaborative piece. It wasn't about exhibit some work, some, you know, it was, you're, you're going to join in into a, an online piece of work. We don't really know what it's going to look like yet. It's hard for me to separate um, how I felt about the project from the circumstances in which we were doing it. Um, I was in Canada on what should have been the sabbatical of a lifetime. I've saved up research leave so that I could work in the archives of universities there for six months, while my Canadian partner, who was on maternity leave, um, was going to hang out with her friends and family. Uh, and in March 2020, we'd got into Canada about 10 days before they went into lockdown because of COVID. So the universities and their archives shut and we were cooped up in a one bedroom apartment um, with no garden, with a nine month old baby and a dog and our airline grounded for nobody knew how long. So it was a pretty challenging and dispiriting time. And... The invitation to work on this project um, kind of threw me a lifeline. Um, it gave me something to do in those circumstances. It was work, uh, which I could spend an hour here, an hour there doing while our baby um, was asleep. Uh, it was a form of distraction that took me out of worrying about the present situation. Um, a riddle amongst other things is a kind of a verbal problem. Um, but it's a problem that you can solve if you apply yourself to it, which is similar to the act of translating, which is a set of problems that you can come up with different solutions to. So the project um, gave me an appealing feeling of having control over the parameters of, of various problems that were involved in designing this collaborative um, digital art object. Uh, and that was in stark contrast to the feeling of a whole set of other problems being absolutely out of my control. Um, but there was more than that. It was the sense also of belonging to a community, a virtual community, at precisely the moment that we'd been deprived of the community we were hoping to find in, in Toronto and in Montreal. Um, Jake I'd known quite well for quite a long time, and I was used to collaborating with him on translations of old English riddles and other poems. Um, Meg and I knew slightly less well, and from academic contexts, I'd long admired her blog post about the riddles, but I'd never worked creatively with her. And then Emma, um, I didn't know at all previously, and indeed I'd never worked before with a visual or a material artist. And through Emma, there were all these anonymous collaborators whom I've still never met, 
sending all kinds of images uh, that you've been hearing about that were then animated by Emma's brilliant IT colleague, Luke Hagen. So there were different levels of um, familiarity and intimacy for me throughout our virtual community, from, from an old friend through to strangers that I never got to meet. Uh, and yet together we made something in that incredibly difficult, worrying time. So for me, the project, it gave me a sense of being connected to fellow human beings at a time when we were being forced, all of us, to give up those connections for our own safety. And that sense of community obviously existed across distant space. The others were on the other side of an ocean um, in a country that I was kind of exiled from. That's a very old English poetry theme, the theme of exile. But also across time, a sense of community with those poets and scribes, readers and writers from a thousand years ago, who, like Emma's colleagues, I could never meet, but with whom I now also had this connection of having made something collaboratively in the face of crisis and tragedy <laughs> on a scale that was affecting all of humanity. Um, and that, that felt incredibly consoling. So I got, I got two things out of working on this that are both very characteristic of old English poetry. I got a kind of comitatus, um, that's the, the band of companions in old English poetry, um, Jake, Emma and Megan. Um, and I got a kind of um, consolation or consolatio is the, is the medieval term, the consolation of making together in adversity. Um, and I'm still, I'm still really grateful for what that meant back then at that time. So thanks, Emma. I think we should try now to see if we can get um, the video to work so that you can all see um, how this process came to fruition and what it actually looked like. So, um, Jake, if you could see if you can make it make it go. Oh, so bear with me while I while I fiddle and click, and I'll try and get this to to, to work. And you have to tell me whether you can actually uh, hear it when I when I start to 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 play it and share my screen. So, so we give folks instructions as well about um, participating. Should I do that? Yeah, you do that, Megan. So Jake's going to play the video. Some of you will have played with this already. Many of you possibly. Um, if you just want to either turn your microphone on and shout or type in the chat when it comes to various prompts to make you choose a translation, we're just going to go with the first translation that we hear or appears on our screen. That's what uh, I guess Jake, you'll have to play along. That's what Jake will click on. So be quick, um, it's gotta be a gut response. And I'm, I'm not sure that I'll be able to, I don't know whether I'll be able to, to, to operate the screen while I'm sharing it. So, so all this may- Should be able to, but we'll find to. out. Okay, well, we'll, we'll, we'll see. So, um, okay, I'm gonna share my screen now. The poem you're about to encounter is over a thousand years old. It was written down before the Norman conquest in the Exeter Book, an anthology of medieval English poetry in Exeter Cathedral's library and recognized by UNESCO as one of the world's principal cultural artifacts. That book includes around a hundred riddles, but not their solutions. Just as there is no one right solution to these riddles, there's no one right way to translate them. All translations are interpretations. So we asked three experts to make three different translations of Riddle 57. By listening to their versions and choosing how to translate key words, you will create your own translation, your own riddle. All 180 images in this animation have been submitted by the public in response to the imagery of the poem and its varying interpretations. Deus lift beer at little wichte. The air bears little beings. The breeze carries tiny creatures. This emptiness floats little somethings. 
So now you, the audience, choose which word. Oh, we've got bears already. That win. Over bear flavor. Over craggy hills. Over braes and banks. Over steep, bright slopes. Where are we going? Craggy hills, braes and banks. Deep bright slopes. Deep bright slopes. Fastened black a swear swear to sallow pada. Remarkably black they are cloaked in shadow darkly. They are jet black and dusty. Sallow shawl. They're blinked out in nightwear, black dark. Fallow shawled. Sangas rope hyap and fairath. Unstinting of song, they travel in troops. Loud as a chanter's drone, they swarm in droves. Full of song and keyed together. Keyed together. Chluda Chirmath. Call out loudly. Draw noisily they carry the noise call out treadath bear on nefas chwilam bursalo nitha bjarma trample tree filled shores sometimes perch on dwellings of the children of men Sometimes they visit groves and glen, sometimes buzz the colonies of men. Sometimes tracked on timbered stands, the headlands of the bands of men. Trample. Nemna to Silfa. They call themselves by name. Please be naming yourselves then. They name themselves. They name themselves. They have slipped beard little weekter over bear cleoba. Thus in black a swede a swear to salopada. Sang as rope a hyap and fairath, chlued a chirmath. Treadeth beronessas, chilem burg salonitha bjarma, nemnath his silfe. The air bears little beings. Over steep bright slopes. They are jet black and dusty. Sallow shawl. Full of song and keyed together. Call out loudly. Trample tree filled shores, sometimes perch on dwellings of the children of men. They name themselves. So you can probably stop share now, Jake. Um, and that, there we are, together we created a Franken poem. I'm struck again by the artwork then it's just amazing isn't it and um that uh, seeing that that piece of road kind of come in um at, at a certain point early on it's uh, it's really amazing and we've arrived to the point where the audience can join in and ask us questions i think we're just about to time so we've got got a good 15 20 minutes um for people to ask us questions 
should I take the spotlight off us? Yeah. I guess if I take it off, then people, if you ask a question, you will be recorded. Um, but you can also type your question in the chat. I'll I'll remove the spotlight. Well, they can also just turn their cameras off, can't they? Yes, you're welcome to turn your cameras off. Or on. Or okay. on. So basically, whoever speaks now will um will appear in the recording. Uh, there's a comment from Kit Richards. Um, he says, not a question, but just wanted to say that was incredible. And I wanted to say that too, Emma, um, just how um, beautiful your final product was. Um, what a lovely, peaceful mood it created. And it's sort of, as sort of a gift from a moment of anxiety to the future. I think it was a really lovely, lovely thing. Yeah, I, I, I'm struck by it too. I mean, every time you play it, you get a different result. And I loved seeing that. So there's combinations of artwork that I'd never seen because I hadn't chosen those. Um, I guess we, I could add at this point that I'm, as a printmaker, this project keeps, this project continues for me because I'm teaching this with primary schools. And in some of those slides we saw earlier were responses. So now we are able to take in vellum and parchment and explore the materials and we make Oak Girl Link and we listen to this. And I watch them playing this and listening to this in the classroom as we're printing and, and making. And it's such a great uh, riddle and a project around the riddle to encourage people to have the confidence to have their own children, especially to have their own um, interpretations. I think so many times people are, it's kind of like only, only if you've got an authority are you able to illustrate the, the riddle or the poem. And that's almost how this project started when I, when I, I began it, it, because we were following other patterns. Whereas with this group, um, it, it shifted and it became a really, it's a really creative experience. Um, a question from Craig Williamson. Please go ahead, Craig. I don't have a question, but I have a comment. So um, it seems to me that uh, something really interesting is going on here, which I would call the relationship between the anxiety of unknowing and the ecstasy of unfolding. When you first come to a riddle, if you haven't looked at all the possible solutions, you go through this process of thinking it could be this, it could be that, what is metaphoric, what is literal. And it drives you a little bit crazy because you can't get settled, you know, and you have dreams about these things and, and, um, and your world is kind of turned upside down. And what the project has done is to take the riddle, like a little box, a paper box, and unfold it in a kind of infinite number of ways. So that when the kids come to it, they see, oh, all these different things, you know, and, um, and they can choose or go through this process themselves. But I think what's so interesting about the riddles is that, um, that as grown-ups, we think in terms of certain categories of perception. And they're kind of reified. And the riddles are actually forcing us to go back into a state of childhood and to see without knowing. And the kids kind of do that naturally, which is, you know, I think I've said before, the kids, when I teach riddles and ask people to write riddles, they do it much better than grownups. And so what it's doing for us as grownups is to pull us back down into the child's world in which we don't have such rigid form formulated categories and to begin to see the world in a new way. And that's why I think they're so brilliant and so important, not only in you know the medieval period, but to us just making us see the world with new eyes. Yes, thank you. It's like a child's world, but also a poet's world, isn't it? Yes. It's that, that unfolding of language and, and metaphor. Thank you very much. Can um, I respond? Can Sorry? I respond, Jenny? Yes, go for it. Um, just to say that it's not just riddles as well. Old English poetry in general is so useful for these sorts of exercises. I've started um, making students making, <laughs> that's very, one way direction. I started encouraging students to draw poems in class as a way of a sort of warm up exercise before we do close readings. And then from their drawings, um, they pull out whatever their key themes or key words are. And then that's what we end up discussing in our seminars. So I sort of use this visual um, translation experience as a way of bringing it into university classroom too. And it works really well. I thought the students would push back. I thought they'd be uncomfortable. 
they usually giggle a little bit in the beginning, but then they get really into it. And now my office is covered in amazing drawings of panthers and whales. What more could you want? And that's marvelous. I just uh, there was a comment from Judy Kendall in the in the chat saying about um, she was thinking about um, she said she loves the way uh, that Emma's related this to primary schools, but she was thinking about it for MA students. And Megan, I guess you've got undergrad students as well that have been using this technique. So this is this is a very wide range. Um, Judith Holly, you've got your hand up. Go ahead, please. Hi. Um, that was wonderful. Uh, really. Uh, beautiful work and just the, the, the account of, of, of how you um, how you made it work during difficult circumstances and then produce something lovely at the end. Um, I had a couple of, 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 of thoughts about um, creative responses so that it's really interesting that the, you know, the riddles are a creative thing in themselves but then you are using them to produce creative responses and I was thinking about the difference between uh, or, or at the moment, I'm also, I'll show you while I'm um, listening attentively, I'm finishing off another creative response, which is a pair of blue stockings that came from a project that friends of mine, I'm an 18th centuryist, they've produced some blue stockings, <laughs> patterns for blue stockings in response to the original blue stocking club. And there's a beautiful book and it's an interactive thing and they have knit alongs and essays and artwork so that this, this concept of the blue stocking has 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 spawned a whole lot of other things that can then turn into something else. And that seems to be um, a particularly modern and, and partly, and this is not meant in a, in a cynical way, but it, it's partly, um, it's a funded project, isn't it? So that it, uh, when we apply for grants, we put in creative outputs, freelance uh, artists are dependent on these outputs. So there's a, there's a particular economy that's involving people, which is which is a very um, it's a, it's a productive economy, and I don't want to, to to make it sound as if I'm I'm critical of it. And so I wondered if you'd like to talk, respond to that, but also I wonder how this might relate to what you know about how people used, created, answered, played with riddles when they were first written. Is there much known about that? Um. Who shall I who shall I direct that to? I was wondering, I was actually thinking for the first part of the question that Judith was asking there, maybe I don't know, Jake, whether you wanted to respond to that at all? Or would that be better for Emma? So was the, was the question really about about um I am not sure I, I, I was just trying to kind of get get the get the bone the question out really, which was something about the, the kind of creative economy, but um Okay, um, so sorry, um two questions. One is what do we know about how they are originally received. And the second is there seems to be a particularly modern way of receiving, responding to um, the past, which very often involves um, creative responses. And that those are often um, tied up with, yes, a creative economy and literally uh, it, it can be a, a cash nexus too. Okay. Yeah, I see what you mean. Um, yeah, I mean, I, you know, one of one of the one of the things that I would say about this project is the 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 the, the kind of the transfer of um, creative energy in this project is really um, different to 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 other projects where often there's a kind of you know there can be in in certain projects a sense that um you know you you you're 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 going along to kind of do a creative workshop with people and and you know yeah yeah you know the experience of of doing something creative is supposed to have value in itself and you know there's 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 kind of lots of this stuff around but what's really unusual about this project is the and and you know maybe maybe it's not clear from from what we've said today but you know there are kind of several stages of the project which um Kind of involve genuine exchange you know so there's the, there's there's you know my kind of prompt poem kind of went out but it was never part of the project it was just used to kind of solicit and elicit responses from printmakers and then those those responses kind of came in and they're they're literally used to make you know that they're, they're all that, that, that's all they're all made into that film 
And then that film is now used to, you know, Chris Jones, I know, uses it in teaching and, and, and you've heard kind of Megan talking about that experience and Emma. So that that's become something that's that's used again to kind of um, elicit responses and um, kind of have people kind of make things. And there's just something very um, admirable and unusual about that, 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 that it's something about the way that the 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 responses are um, elicited uh, and then used and then you know it's not just for the sake of the response it's actually making something that's then actually used and has value and goes on and is used again and 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 makes more things and I think the this project is very unusual in that you know um, yeah I think I yeah, can I, I was gonna I say Emma go ahead Emma and then we can let Megan answer the other question. Yes, Megan can answer the facty stuff. So I was just thinking in terms of, that's an interesting question about, and about creative responses. You, you, this project could have been done in lots of ways. We could have said, right, we're going to commission some established printmakers and we'd like them to, and we're going to pay them and they're going to create some very high quality responses. Um, or you could look at it as kind of, we're just going to get some public engagement because we're Arts Council funded and we really need to do that. Um, but actually, it, I think all we could have held onto it as a double elephant, only our members and printmakers, but it just was way more interesting to open it up, partly because we were really looking for those connections, partly because it's a pilot project, we haven't done anything like this, and because nobody's work was going to remain in that typical domain of visual art in a frame or in a white space gallery, it was going to be chopped up, we didn't really know how, it was going to be animated, so it was very it was a very equal process and we just said join in if you want to these are the prompts send us something if you want um but i agree there could be lots of ways of creative responses um and i think what was freeing was that this wasn't like a commissioning process it wasn't even you know it wasn't a tender some artists got selected or anything it was just everybody who sent in anything pretty much as long as it wasn't obscene could could be part of the project I hope that answers it a little bit. So Thank obscene you. content would scan well with some of the riddles. Um, <laughs> Jenny, do you want to have a debate about whether or not Old English riddles are as linked to education as is commonplace in the scholarship? <laughs> well, I was, I was, I wanted to know what you thought. I, 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 I mean, I my immediate answer to Judith's question is, we have no idea. Um, um, we have the Exeter book. We don't know who made it. We don't know what the purpose of it was. We don't know who read it. We don't know how they used it. Um, there's lots of scholars who have ideas about it, but there's been so many questions. Maybe, maybe Craig Williamson will tell us the answer. So many arguments about what the heck the riddles are doing at the end of the manuscript um, that my answer, as you can see, I'm quite heated about this, is that we don't know. But Megan, what do you think? <laughs> oh, I, I just like the question. We don't know why there was so much smut in a book bequeathed by a bishop. Um, but we didn't focus on that riddle, so let's not go down that route. I guess I like to put the Old English riddles into conversation with the Latin riddles, which were used as kind of metrical experiments and were used in classrooms and, um, you know, were sent by very high ranking ecclesiastes to their king buddies um, to show off and also to play with Latin poetry. And the Old English riddles are doing something different, but similar. They're caught up in that same tradition. Um, yeah, I mean, we don't know. I like Jenny's answer. Craig, you've got your hand up. Are you going to jump in on this? I am going to jump in on this. I mean, we have some old Norse poems in which riddles are traded between, you know, various deities and figures in, in order to save a person's life. So, you know, and and there there are a variety of things. The Frank's casket has a riddle on it, you know, you know, which is has the answer to whale's bone. But I think honestly, um, the thing, the thing that surprises you, you know, after you've forgotten it is that there are no answers written down for these riddles. I write riddles, lots of people write riddles, you know. I was asked to write riddles for um, the opening of the, of the website um, that Warner Brothers started when The Hobbit was published. You cannot write a group of riddles without giving the answers because people are willing to work at the answers for a while, but they have to know that there's an answer. So I couldn't write a hundred riddles and not put the answers down and get that book published. 
But whoever collected these riddles for the Exeter book did not give the answers. And most Latin riddles had the answers as titles. So there is something going on here, you know, no, as, as if to say, here is an intellectual maze, you know, run through it and see what you can do. But I'm not giving you the answer. The process of your running through it and trying out different answers and figuring out what's going on here, that's the important thing. And I think that's a really significant thing. I love that reflection. And I'm going to name drop um, an author. I was talking to AJ Jacobs shortly after this, um, who is writing a book on puzzles and riddles. And he kept asking me, doesn't it frustrate you that you don't know the answer? And I kept saying, I don't want to know the answer. I just like the poetry. I like the close reading. I like the working with the language. I'm rubbish at solving riddles. You heard that here first. Um, I can't solve them to save my life. And he just couldn't, he kept sort of nudging me saying, everyone else I've interviewed for this book is, is always wants to solve the puzzle. They want to know the answer. They treat it quite mathematically. And I was like, no, I'm a humanities person. I just like reading poetry. Well, I like answering the riddles, but I like answering them again and again and again. And I like having different answers each time. I like to, I like to answer it and then say, but that's not really it. Here's another answer. Here's another answer, which is why I love Jake's poem. Um, the way it kept saying, or this, or this, or this. Um, Craig, you still got your hand up. Did you have another question you wanted to ask or? No, I should probably stop talking now, but I, I, just to respond to what you said, hmm. as you try an answer and then you try another answer and then you try another answer. So then you start to think, how are these swallows, are these birds like musical notes or how are they like letters on a page? And all of a sudden you have a mindset that links all of these possible answers together. And it's a way of looking at the world that's quite new and quite revolutionary. And I think that's, that's what really kind of amazes you and helps you to think about you know, some unknown thing and its, and its connections with, with the possible answers. It's brilliant, really. No, I, I completely agree. <laughs> Does anyone else like to say, so we're just gonna have this um, appreciation fest for the Exeter book riddles, that'd be fun too. But does anyone want to ask our, um, our collaborators any more questions about their process? Oh, go ahead, Laura, please. Hi, thank you. Um, I had a question for um, Megan, and this is um, sort of partly to do with what I'm doing in my teaching of Old English at the moment. I'm getting my students to do some creative translations for me tomorrow, um, and I'm going to show them the video and we'll we'll have a play around with it. Um, I think they'll absolutely love it. Um, I wanted to ask you what, um, what did you learn about the riddle itself by being involved in this process? Because I'm asking my students to do some kind of creative version translation whatever they want to do turn it into you know a prose short story whatever whatever they like um and then i'm going to ask them and and how did that feed back into your sense of the original poem did it did it teach you something did it make you think about the original poem differently um so i'm just wondering how it kind of fed back into your sense of that that riddle do you view that riddle differently or did it spark off any kind of thoughts in your own uh, riddle scholarship I was very convinced that I knew the correct answer to this riddle <laughs> and that the final line they named themselves was actually a reference to crow us, you know, crow, crow naming themselves and that it was a more explicit puzzly clue. Um, and in fact, we all three of us, Jake, Chris and I made little videos explaining our translation process, which you can watch on that website when you get to the end of the riddle if you want. And the first version I had, I was sort of cheekily being like, mine's the correct solution. And after working with Jake and Chris and also watching their responses, I was just like, I'm going about this completely the wrong way. All of these possibilities are there. And when you work through every single word of this short poem in depth and in detail and all the different possibilities, just something that Chris and Jake do all the time together. They work really closely going through the full range of senses. I should just let you talk, Jake. Um, so I guess I kind of, despite claiming that I'm open to all these different solutions, I realized how ingrained in me as a scholar the right solution was. And that's probably because of all the scholarship I read on riddles, which is very fighty and lots of people who think they know what's best. 
so it helps me to just sort of open up and to be genuinely more collaborative in my approach to the riddles as a whole I think that's that's great Megan thank you you're welcome Jake do you want to say anything about your process with Chris yeah, so, so um, yeah, I mean, as, as you've mentioned, Megan, I, I, and Chris, you know, as we know, Chris isn't here, but um, he and I have worked for, for quite a few years just looking at the riddles and in a kind of companionable way, you know, I was thinking about it and thinking what's what's really great about it is that we, because we, we used to be colleagues and we, we just used to find time to sit down and, and look at, you know, a riddle in, in kind of half an hour, 40 minutes and and, you know, it was a brilliant experience for me because obviously Chris, you know, takes me through the, the old English and takes me through those, um, that, that vocabulary and that language and those, those possible uh, tilts of, of sense and, and, and movement between the, the literary, the, 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 the literal and the metaphorical. So, you know, I'm, but what's really lovely about it is the kind of companionability of that, you know, um, and, and, you know, we, we feel like we're sitting down and, and, and trying to solve them again, you know. Um, I mean, it's what's really, and just just talking about thinking about what you what you've just been talking about, and what's really exciting for me about the riddles is their the, their sense of flickeringness. You know, they they flicker between solutions in a way that I think is, um, I mean, is it is it pur purposeful? I mean, I, I'm not quite sure, but it certainly seems to be in the nature of them now that that you know they can easily be. Um, to two or three solutions, and they're they're kind of, they're, they seem to be kind of aware aware of that somehow, aware that um, you know it could be it could be you know it could be letters, it could be crows. There's something about the the, the relationship between crows and letters, and between the way that crows make the make the noise that they do. Um, you know, they're, it's kind of webbed in, and all that I find really intriguing. And I'm I'm not. I'm even more intrigued by the riddles that we, we don't have any idea what the answer is, um, because there's something very interesting about that as somebody who writes poems. Um, there's something about that and about poetry which haven't quite worked out, but the idea that you have a text and it describes something, we don't know what that thing is, is just fundamentally um, interesting and a challenge to like language and poetry itself and what 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 language is um which which i find really intriguing you know thank you very much i i've got lots of things i'd like to say but i can see that we've already gone one minute past our time so i just want to thank you jake and emma and megan and chris who can't be here for um creating this wonderful project and thank you also to our audience for coming and listening and, and putting the questions in and participating, collaborating with us and enjoying it. I think it's a, a wonderful model and I hope that there will be more projects like this. Um, you could do Riddle 10 next, you know, like, like it would be a wonderful project. So thank you very much. Could we please maybe unmute ourselves or use the, the applause button to, to say thank you to our, to our team. Thank you very much.